the impression that the last day of the conference people everybody's are exhausted <laughs> yeah. it. sure but I've been partying uh, for <laughs> okay oh yeah you had your celebration yesterday yeah at lunch yeah, at lunch yeah. okay good so, so now you're officially a member again of Texas Yesterday, you, actually. Since yesterday. Excellent game. When you go back? In the fall? No, no, in the August. Actually. In August, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You start teaching in August too. Yeah, the first. Okay. Not that early. Yeah. So. Do you think wait five minutes? Uh, oh, whatever you like. I mean, I'm, I'm flexible. Okay. I mean, I might then go over five minutes. Yeah, but, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Is there still a problem? <clears throat> okay. Why does well start? Okay, so welcome to the last morning of the conference and uh, to the last lecture of uh, Michael Loss. Thank you, Francesco. So I, I wrote uh, a few things down which we talked about last time. So the first model here is this thermostat model where you have a function of m variables. That's your initial condition. And you have a master equation of the following type. You have these m particles interacting with each other. That's according to the Katz model, totally standard. That's this piece. Lambda is just a constant. Okay? And then you have an interaction of these particles with a the thermostat, right? which is an infinite. It's an infinite reservoir, thermal reservoir. And the idea there is you draw randomly a particle of this infinite reservoir, which is in a thermal equilibrium. So, so as a physicist, you would say you sample this reservoir, uh, we, we, uh, which is distributed according to a, a Maxwell in distribution with temperature beta. Beta is 1 over kT, so that's given. And then you scatter this particle with your particle of the system. And then you that this particle of the system changes somehow, the probability distribution. But the particle which you drew out of the infinite reservoir, you discard. Okay? So the, res the infinite reservoir never changes. It just stays in equilibrium for the rest of its infinite life. Okay? So that's the idea. And then what you can prove, this was a theorem by Bonnet, the Vaidya, Nathan, and myself, is that when you take the relative entropy, so the gamma m is just the Gaussian function. I call a Gaussian function gamma m, and because I don't want to constantly write Gauss, right? And by the way, here I've chosen beta to be 2 pi in order to simplify life. I don't have to carry around this normalization factor, okay? Makes life easier. Okay, so now you look, I call it the thermal entropy, because what is it? It's relative to the, to the, to the thermal state. And that turns out to be the equilibrium state. In fact, we can show that the thermal entropy decays exponentially fast to zero, 
and mu rho is given by this expression here. And you notice it only depends on this mu, which is the interaction with the thermostat. Of course, that's to be expected because the Katz model really doesn't have a very good entropy production. We have learned this from Villani's theorem and for this counterexample of Amit, okay? Or this example of Amit, enough. Okay, so this is the infinite thermostat. Now you say to yourself, okay, let me put myself in a finite reservoir. So I have my system coordinate, V1 to Vm, and then I have the reservoir coordinates, W1, M plus 1 to Wn plus M. Okay? So what do you do? You look again at the master equation. This time, of course, it's a master equation which acts on functions of two variables, V and W. And my initial condition is, again, the same initial conditions that I had here. The F0 is the same, but the reservoir I put in the thermal state. Okay? So that's what my initial condition is. And now you let this thing run. And lots of interesting things happen. The particles themselves, among each other, they collide, according to Katz. The reservoir particles also collide with each other. And then you have this interaction of the system's particles with the reservoir particles. That's this interaction here. And that's, again, just a collision. And notice this collision rate have been chosen in such a way that when I take a particle of the system, that the rate of collision with any particle in the reservoir is constant, independent of n. The collision rate of a particle in the reservoir with any particle in the system is, however, a rate which is m divided by n times mu, which is very, very small when you think of n as very, very large. So we think of n as much, much larger than M. Okay? Good. So now, there was a theorem of Bonetto, Tusunian, and Vaidya, Nathan, and myself, which says the following. And that's what you would expect in a certain sense, namely, that when you take the time evolution of this system here, this is this function, now you multiply by a Gaussian, which is thermal. And now you take the time evolution of that system, which in some sense has the same initial condition as this one, right? Then the difference, this distance, which is called the gavetta toscani Wenberg distance, is bounded above by m divided by n, and this constant is roughly of order 1. And this is uniformly in time. So in other words, when you choose n very large, this system here, which is very complicated, is described by that system, which is fairly simple, uniformly in time, right? So these two things keep close together forever and ever and ever. Notice, there's a funny thing about this. What's the thermal state here, uh, the, the, the equilibrium state? The equilibrium state is a state, of course, which has to be rotational invariant. After all, what do you do? You have here averages of rotation, averages over rotation, and averages over rotation. So when you start with this state, all you have to do is you average the state of all rotations in Rn plus m, in this huge space. What you get is a function which in general is not a Gaussian. Okay? Nevertheless, this inequality is still true because Gaussians in very large dimensions and spherically symmetric functions somehow are very, very close. You can estimate this. So the spherical average of this function and when you replace this by a Gaussian, these things are very, very close in this distance. Okay? So that's somehow the description of comparison. Now here's the question. So we know that in the thermostat, in this system here, the entropy decays exponentially fast. So far, we had never any clue what could be the entropy for this system. So what do I do? You take your solution of this large master equation, right, which is terribly complicated. Now, you agree, you are not interested in the particles which are in the reservoir. That just stays there, right? And they change, they move around. So what you do is you take the marginal of your distribution with respect to W. That gives you a function. I call it again f of vt. It's, of course, not the same solution as this one. 
it's not. But let me call it f of vt, otherwise I'm running out, as to, uh, out of letters, OK? So what would you expect? You would expect that the entropy should also decay. Well, it shouldn't decay to 0. Why not? Because the equilibrium state is not the Gaussian. You see, this entropy is always with respect to the Gaussian. But still, what you would expect is it should decay relatively fast to a, and to become relatively fast small, or small relatively fast, I should say, right? OK, That's, that would be reasonable. Why? Because you say, this system seems to be, in this metric, well approximated by that system. This system has fast entropy decay. Yes, this entropy should also decay, maybe not to 0, but it should get small fast. OK? So, and here's a theorem. And this theorem has not been published yet, but uh, it's, it's about to be written up here. Bonetto, Geisinger, Reed, and myself. So Geisinger and Reed are two German graduate students. They visited Georgia Tech. And during that time, we cooked up the following theorem. S thermal of F dot and t is less or equals. OK, so remember, what do I do? I take this solution, I integrate against dw, and I plug it in here. And I divide by gamma n, m, which is the Gaussian in m variables. OK? And remember, the idea is that should become small, fast. Here's the theorem. This is less or equals m divided by n plus m. Well, that's already good news, right? Because when n is very, very large compared to m, this is tiny. What's left? Plus n divided by n plus m. Well, that's really bad news, but what you have is e to the minus mu rho times, <clears throat> I have just to get the exponent right, yeah, times the entropy of your initial condition. That's it. That's the result. So you see, it's, it's kind of interesting, right? And the mu rho is precisely this number here. So what is this telling you? It tells you when you take the, I mean, and by the way, I mean, these are real honest constants. This is really a one here, and that's it. I mean, that's the computation, OK? So now you see, when you let n do infinity, what happens? This goes to 0, this goes to 1, this goes to this exponent here, which is 1. So that's exactly, you replicate precisely that result. OK? Yeah? Now, we know Vaidya Nathan Ranjini, Vaidya Nathan is a very smart lady. She really figured out that this was the best possible power here. So therefore, and that's non-trivial. Huh? Uh, and therefore, you know that this cannot be improved, this rate. So in a way, it's kind of surprising that you can get for such a complicated system sharp rates. Right? That's kind of surprising. And now for the remaining time, I would like to explain to you how you might go and prove something like that. Okay? And things can get a little bit complicated. So what I'm going to do in my talk is I give you first steps uh, how to approach this. And when the formulas get large, I will use slides to explain the rest of, you, of that to you, OK? All right, so now let's compute. So, so, so you do something outright crazy. What you're going to do is you take this L. Remember, you have to compute e to the LT. And the way you do it is you just expand it in terms of a power series, right? Brute force. This is what physicists do, right? And then you think afterwards what you can do with it. So what is it? So the E, so, so let, me, let me set up the L once more. Notice when I, here, here I always subtract the identity, right? And I can actually, when I wipe out the identity here, when I wipe it out, then of course I have to correct things again. And by the way, the n here in this theorem, the n just has to be bigger than m. It 
doesn't have to be large. It's still true. Okay? So, so then what you have to do is you have to subtract a certain constant lambda. And what is this lambda? It's, well, lambda s divided by m minus 1. How many terms do you have in here? m choose 2, right? So that's just lambda s over 2, uh, what is it, uh, m plus lambda r n over 2 plus, and how many terms do you have? Well, here you have n, which kills this, so you have mu times n. So this is my lambda, right? And then it can go and expand the power, this thing in a power series. And let me be very generous, because you see, that's the nice thing about the video. I can now write the formula, and after starts, afterwards, I can wipe things out and fill things in, because it's recorded, right? That's kind of nice. So I don't have to repeat the formula constantly. Sum k equals 0 to infinity, lambda t to the k divided by k factorial. And then you have a sum over lambda alpha 1. I explain what these things are. Alpha 1, alpha k. And then you have r alpha 1, r alpha k. OK? So, so what did I do? I looked at my L. Now let me sort of expose it a little bit better. Forget about this. I wipe, wipe this out. And, uh, and we don't need this either. So here's my L. Huh? So what you do is, I, fa I, I have an e to the minus lambda t, which I forgot. And then I have a lambda t to the k. What do I do? I pull out a lambda in front of the L. So I have lambda s divided by m minus 1 times lambda. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. Capital lambda. Then I have a lambda r divided by n, n minus 1 times lambda. And I have a mu divided by n lambda. Right? Let's just pull this out. Now, what's nice about these numbers? When I sum these numbers, right, here, here, and here, I get 1. These are convex weights. OK? That's the, that's, yeah, I mean, after all, what did you do? You, you, you have m choose 2 terms times this, m choose 2 ones times that, n times n times that. And now I divide by this total sum. These are convex weights. OK? And these are these weights in here. And what do I do? I have to sum here over all possible pairs which show up in the collisions. OK? Right? I mean, there could be a collision which corresponds to these guys, collisions which corresponds to those and those. And they come up in all possible uh, combinations. And that's what my sum is here. OK? So it's a little bit, well, a little bit. It's just terrible at the moment, right? Good. And now what you do is you apply it to a function. And then you have to ask yourself what these R alphas are doing. Well, what are they doing? I, so, so let me make a certain um, a simple transformation first. It's always convenient to write things in the following way. I define this H0 in this fashion, or h, sorry, just h. Why am I doing this? Look, when I go to these variables, that means that my function f of v, uh, yeah, let's make h0. So let, me, let me write it this way. f0 of v is then just a Gaussian times m of v times h0. Okay? Now, let's look at our initial condition. The total initial condition was f0 of v and w is this function times the Gaussian n times h0 of v. Agreed? That's what it is. Right? Because my initial condition here was given in this word. So now what, what do you realize? You realize that this product here 
is a Gaussian m plus n. So this is a radial function. A radial function, the Katz model, L, when you apply L to a radial function, well, you don't see it. It's invariant. It doesn't move, right? Because after what is Katz, Katz just averages over rotation. Rotational invariant functions don't move, OK? So what does this mean? It means that when I stick in here my f0 of v and w, I can replace this f0 by h0 times of v, agreed? Times this Gaussian, but this Gaussian I can push through and pull it out here. You agree? That's what you get. And W. Good. Now, what I'm supposed to do now? I'm supposed to do, so let me make sure that I, I get this, this thing straight. What is our little f of vt? Well, it's the integral of what did I say? f of vw and t dw. OK? But there is one Gaussian, the gamma m, which is not affected by w. It just comes out. So you can pull it out here. E, sorry. And then you have the integral e to the lt applied to what? Well, it's applied to this function h0 which gives you a function of v and w, and then you integrate against the Gaussian. OK? That's what you get. You see, this Gaussian gamma n is not affected anymore by the evolution, right? Because this whole thing came in front of the evolution. It's out here. OK? All right. And now, you see, this f of v t can be written as a gamma m of v times a function of t. So I will call this naturally h of v t. Agreed? This makes life simpler. Let's look at the entropy. How does the entropy look like? The entropy is, where did I write it here? I put in f of v t the logarithm of f of v t divided by gamma m. You see this gamma n drops out. Huh? So therefore, you know that the entropy you're worrying about is the entropy as thermal, which is equals to the integral of h log h gamma m dv. That's it, right? Good. So, so I think we have, we have simplified things a little bit, right? No ratios anymore. The Gaussians come in a nice place. And in particular, we will see that this Gaussian is absolutely lovely. We will enjoy this hugely afterwards. So, so let me now write down what we have to work out. And also, let me introduce some silly notation. And I would like to do it this way. Look, this h0 is really only a function of v. And that makes life confusing, because when you apply the e to the lt, you get actually a function of v and w, right? So what you really have to think of this h of v as a h0 of v as a function in v and w. So I'm going to write this h0 in the following way, just as a reminder, h0 of v. I write this as h0 composed with p of v and w. And what is the p? The p is just a projection. I know it's, too, it's, it's a little bit silly, but I, I do this only to remind ourselves that these are really functions in the whole space, and this L really acts on everything, OK? We have to keep this in mind. OK, good. All right, so with all these preparations, how does this uh, uh, thing look like here now? Uh, I can just continue here. Our evolution is this one, h0 composed with p, right? This guy just acts on that one. And over here, I just put h0 composed with p. Good. 
So now let's go and start writing out what these things are. And again, it's getting even worse, right? This is already pretty bad, now it's getting worse. This is the integral of d theta 1, rho theta 1, integral d theta k, rho theta k, right? And then what you have to do is you have to stick in here the rotations. And what you have is the product, and I'm going to write it this way, r lowercase r alpha j, j runs from 1 up to k of theta k, j. I mean, can you read this? No, you can't. Huh? Let me write this better. So this is of product j equals 1 to k r <coughs> alpha j of theta j applied to the function v, uh, to the vector v and w. Okay? You agree? That's what it is. And you see, it looks pretty lousy, right? But notice this is a rotation. Okay? And this rotation, what does it do? It acts on all these vectors. And then afterwards, what you do, you take a projection. Okay? So that's what, in some sense, you have to compute. And that's the stuff which you have to plug in and work something out. Okay? So now let me point out a few things, which is kind of interesting. When you look at this, this is a rotation. Now, it's a good idea to write this rotation as AK, BK, CK, and DK. What is this AK? AK is an M by M part of the matrix. So this is the M part, an N part, here's an M part, and here's an N part. Okay? So this is uh, an M by N, this is N by M, and this is N by N. But now notice, and, and this AK depend in the terrible ways on these alphas and the thetas and everything, okay? Now, what do you know? You know that this, AK, that this is a rotation matrix, right? Because this came as a product of rotations, right? These are rotations. Remember what are these? These are rotations in the plane specified by this pair alpha J, right? These are these rotations. And you just stack them up. So what you notice is that <clears throat> AK, AK transposed plus BK, BK transposed must be the identity in M dimensions. I mean, everybody knows that, right? That's, that's essentially the definition of a rotation. And about the other terms, I actually don't care. I don't just ignore it, okay? Good. Now notice, by the way, the B is not a simple matrix, right? Now, what do you do next? Why do I do this decomposition? I know I do this composition because what does the P do? The P takes this vector, right? I, I, I multiply this matrix by this vector. And what the P does is it just picks out the top components. All right? So therefore, what I can do now is and this is the point about the P, I can replace this mess by what? By H of AK. And remember, the AK depends on everything. Let me indicate this in this way. V plus BK alpha theta W. Agreed? It's just it's true. So let me just check. Now what do I do next? Next I do the following. I take this whole mess. I mean, you agree so far it looks terrible. But what I do is I integrate this dw e to the minus pi w squared. Remember, I, uh, I mean, these are the joys of the Gaussian. 
All right? Now you see, all these numbers here, this is now gone. Remember? The H, everything divided out. What do I do? I multiply this. For, I mean, you see, these are just constants from the point of W. All I do is I take this and multiply this by e to the minus pi w squared. And this is an integral over rn. OK? And now we can start simplifying. Look, what is this bk? This bk is an m by n matrix. So really what I'm seeing here is just a vector which has <coughs> m components. All right? But you see, the W runs over Rn. And now you just think a little bit. You can actually factor this matrix B as 1 minus A tra transposed A to the power, no, sorry, A, A transposed to the power 1 half times a rotation, let's call it beta. And this is a rotation, right? I mean, it's a, a, sorry, it's an isometry. And what, what kind of an isometry is it? It maps the whole space Rn into the subspace Rm. So therefore, now you notice when you, when, you, when you split your coordinates into one in this subspace and the one perpendicular to it, these variables here which are left over, they don't see this expression. The Gaussian is normalized. You just integrate. So what you get by this little computation is, and can just wipe, this is a nice thing, you get one identity minus AK, AK transposed to the power one half, W e to the minus the pi W squared. And here, the integral is now over Rm. And now I think some of you guys might actually sort of see what's going on. What does this remind you of for the experts? Remember? <laughs> Let's just do this. This is what is called the Ornstein-Unbeck semigroup. Right? And what you have here is precisely an orange and Uhlen spec semigroup, but what is your problem? Your problem is that this, these are matrices. Right? This is your problem. These are matrices. Now, what's the point about the orange and Uhlen spec semigroup? There is a fantastic theorem which goes back to Edward Nelson. And let me write this Nelson's theorem here. So we don't need this anymore. So nt is this gadget here, integral h of e to the minus t v plus e1 minus e to the minus 2t w e to the minus pi w squared dw. Theorem, Nelson. Uh, and, and, and I can really, I cannot pin down the date. I don't know. You know, in those days, things didn't really, they didn't really publish right away. I mean, some people had remarks about Nelson's theorem, published their remarks before Nelson published his theorem, but it's very well known. It's due to Nelson. When you take nt h in the q norm, and what do I mean by the q norm? It's always the q norm with respect to the Gaussian measure. That's lesser or equals h p norm. Well, so far, not too interesting, but what it says is, in particular, is that the p minus 1 is equals e to the minus 2t q minus 1. You see, that's interesting. And, that, and that's a hard theorem, actually. Why? Because what it says is that the q here can be actually larger than p. Okay? It cannot be too large, because once this is larger than this p minus 1, this operator is not even bounded. But when, it's, when this relation is satisfied, then you know you have this estimate and the constant one is sharp. Okay? 
Now, what you do with that theorem is the following. You have a little corollary. And what you do is the following. You have um, S of nth is, equal, is less or equals e to the minus 2t, the integral f log, uh, I mean, sorry, h log h e to the minus pi uh, v squared dv. I just wrote out the entropy, right, to remind you again that this is the entropy s of h. I write it this way, right? So this entropy, so when you stick in the Nelson's kernel, you get this estimate, and then you get some, some remainder, and this remainder looks like this, integral h log integral h. And of course, the integral is always with respect to the Gauss measure. Now you notice, when the h is normalized, this is zero. You don't worry about it, OK? OK? So that's what you have. The proof is disgustingly easy once you accept this theorem. Why? Because you see, when you take the L1 norm, sorry, I forgot to put an h here. When you take the L1, the integral of that, you just get the integral of h. So it's actually, you have equality when q is equals p is equals 1. So then what you do is, you subtract the L1 norms from both sides, you divide by q minus 1, q minus 1, and you take the limit q to 1, and you forget, don't forget this relation here, out pops this inequality. I'm not going to get into this, all right? So this is the hypercontractive estimate. It's, a, it's, it's actually a theorem out of quantum field theory, believe it or not. That's what, what instigated this whole hypercontractivity stuff. Right? Because you see, you can generalize these theorems to infinite dimensions, basically, without giving up on the constants. Right? One stays a one, right? You can multiply it as many times as you like. OK. So now, how do we use this? What I would like to do now is I would like to keep this formula and show you how one can prove our theorem at least in the case m equals 1 and n, of course, bigger than 1. Right? Keeps life simple. So in this case, in which situation are we? Well, in this case, we're in the situation where the AK is a 1 by 1 matrix. Right? Good. And now you see also that when you take the entropy of that guy, now you see all these weights are convex combinations. You see, the sum of this against that is 1. The sum of all these guys is also 1. These integrals also integrate to 1. So by convexity of the entropy, I can simply go and stick in the entropy here of that gadget. Right? Now, in one dimension, what is my situation? In one dimension, I know by Nelson, remember, the h is now, because it's only a function of one variable, it's normalized in the Gauss measure. So by Nelson's theorem, by the way, it doesn't matter whether this prefactor here, I choose it to be positive or not, it's absolutely clear that these numbers are less than 1 because I have this relation. So they're between 0 and 1. Okay? So I can apply Nelson's theorem, and I get that this whole mess, in the case when m is equals 1, is less or equals d theta k rho of theta k. And then I have a k of alpha and theta times the entropy of my initial condition. Agreed? That's what you have. And now at this moment, there is absolutely no reason to rejoice, right? Because you have absolutely no clue for the moment what this sum could possibly be. Right? Right. Okay. Now, here's a little idea. It turns out you can actually compute this sum explicitly. Okay? And so how do you do that? Let me just, yeah. Ah, that's right. Okay. <clears throat> so let me erase this. So 
So we have to compute this sum. Well, here's the idea. You choose H0 of V to be V squared. Okay? So now you have two things. The first one is the formula. Maybe I write this formula down somewhere and stash it away. So this was this integral e to the minus lambda t sum lambda t to the k over k factorial. k goes from 0 to infinity. Then you have the sum over all pairs. Then you have the integral over the rows. And finally, you have the h of a k. I'm going to write it this way. V plus 1 minus a k k t 1 half w e to the minus. Uh, no, that's just what it is, OK? Uh, no, I can actually do that. Right. So this is this formula, OK? Good. So now what are we going to do? We're going to choose the h0 to be v squared and plug it in our formula. Okay? So then what you get, when you choose the h to be v squared, if h, uh, so this is h0, sorry. Huh? h0 is v squared. What you get? Well, you get the square of that gadget. Agreed? So in our case, when these things are one-dimensional, what you get, you get the ak squared, because that's this guy, v squared. The integral against the Gaussian is 1. And here, what you get, you get the w squared, 1 minus a squared, power 1 half. And then you get the w squared integrate against the Gaussian. It's a one-dimensional integral. That's 1 over 2 pi. So now you get this sum. And you see something. You see that this sum here, together with this a square, a k squared, is precisely what you want. So if you have a chance to compute this thing in a different way, then you're home free, right? And the idea is actually quite simple. What you do is the following. You take e to the l t v squared, e to the minus pi w squared, dw. That's precisely this sum. This is whole mass is precisely that. And now you differentiate. DDT. And what you get is the integral e to the lt, and you have an l in front applied to the v squared, e to the minus pi w squared dw. And now I think it, I, I propose to you as an exercise to compute what this is. When you, when you do this computation more or less carefully, what you find out is that this, let's call this function u of t. It depends, of course, on v, right? u of 0 and of v is what? Well, when the t is equal to 0, you just get v squared integrated against the Gaussian w, that's v squared. When you differentiate this out, it's a complete elementary computation. You learn that du dt satisfies a differential equation. And this differential equation looks like the following. Mu rho 1 over 2 pi plus 1 over n v squared minus mu rho n plus 1 over n u of v. That's what you get. I just recommend you to do this computation. It's extremely simple. Why? Because all you have to do is you have to apply the L to this V squared. There are a bunch of integrations in theta. And, and once you do this computation, out pops this formula. Okay? Now, this is a linear ordinary differential equation so that everybody knows how to solve it. And what do we get? We get. that u is equals to 1 over 2 pi 
n, write it this way, n plus 1, 1 minus e to the minus mu rho n over n plus 1 over n. That's re perfectly reasonable because that's your rate of, the, uh, of decay, right? T plus, and then you get 1 over n plus 1 plus n over n plus 1 e to the minus mu rho n plus 1 over n t v squared. That's what you get. So therefore you know that this piece here must be this sum. Why? Because this is precisely what you get here. And you notice this is precisely what I claimed in this theorem. Okay? So, so this works pretty well. And so now you say, aha, now I can do this one. Of course, it's absolutely obvious. Now you do it for n equals 2, and you run into a wall. You see, I, g I gave you a, a, a little presentation of brass camp -Leap theorems. And so you, you, you're pretty sure now that these brass camp -Leap theorems must be used somewhere in these arguments, right? And that's the reason that's getting a little bit complicated. So I decided to put up some slides about that. Okay. So remember, this is the guy up here, which corresponds to Nelson's estimate, right? I mean, uh, uh, to which we have to apply uh, Nelson's estimate. But you see, this is very complicated, right? The AK is just an M by N matrix. Now, what you're going to do is you're going to what is called make an orthogonal single ovality composition. In other words, you see, I might have some zero eigenvalues in the single ovality, some single values which are zero. I keep them. Okay? So the U is orthogonal, the V is orthogonal, and gamma is a matrix which has non-negative elements in the diagonal. Here they are. Okay? And remember, all these are functions of alpha and theta of all these pairs. Good. Here's your theorem. When you apply Nelson's estimate, this one here, well, I can't see it. Here. Repeatedly. You have to repeat it. Why? Now, you see, when you, when you iterate this estimate, uh, you see, how do you do it? Well, you see, this function has the AK has a u, gamma, v transpose. Now, the v transpose just hangs in there with the v. If you replace variables when you compute the entropy in terms of v, this is just an orthogonal transformation. Everything is rotation invariant. This v drops out. What does not drop out is the u, and the u is stick together with the h. OK? So how does it look? I get this h u here. And I take marginals. Why do I have to take marginals? Because you see, when I apply, for example, Nelson's theorem to a function of two variables where I have different eigenvalues here, then what do I get? I cannot assume that the function, the marginals, are normalized. I cannot assume that. So what I have to do is I have to reiterate this and keep track of all the terms, and that just gives you this huge mess. So what is it? It's the sum over all subsets of the sets 1 to m. When the, when the index is in the complement, you put the gamma i squared, one of these uh, eigen, uh, eigenvalues in the single ovality composition. And when it's in the, in the set, you put the 1 minus gamma j squared. Here, you have to take the marginal in the variables which correspond to sigma. You, you write this, and this is a complicated function. You multiply by the log, you integrate against the u, but you have to integrate it now in the remaining variables, which is an r sigma complement. OK? So this estimate you can get. This is just a repeated application of Nelson's theorem, but you know you have to be a little bit careful. Here I've written out what the h is, h of u, k, v. All right? And the h sigma here is written out as this integral. All right? You notice something. Here, just as a, an important part. Look, what is this? This is actually equals to that. You see what the difference is? Here, I integrate over r to the sigma complement. Here, I integrate over all of rm. Now, what I do? This is the trick. You see, I can simply complement these variables here to a variables in all of rm. It's just a 1, right, when I integrate. And then I can just remove the sigma here, right? 
because after all, these functions only depend on the, on the sigma complement variables. And then finally, I can move the u over, and I can onto this function here, and that's what I get. This is this complicated expression, OK? I mean, I understand that you're not going to follow me, really, but you just you, you want to get sort of the gist of it, OK? All right, next. How do you? So, so, so this was Nelson's theorem. And now what is, what is it? This is the right-hand side of Nelson's <coughs> theorem, right? As sum over all lambdas, as a, uh, integrate over all the rows. It's a huge mess, right? And what I want to do is that this whole mess is less or equals the entropy. That's what I really would like to have. Maybe with a factor, OK? That's somehow the goal. You agree? So how do I do that? Well, here comes Brass Complete, right? It's just written it down again. You have your Hilbert spaces, k of them. They have dimensions ti. You have these maps going from Rm to the Hi's. And you know that this bi, bi transpose is the identity on these Hilbert spaces. Now, what, is more, what's, what, what you also need are these numbers ci, so that when you look at this matrix, you add up to the identity, right? And what does Brass Complete tell you? This huge mess here is less or equals that mess. This is a nice mess. This is a terrible mess. Good. So now, here's a consequence. I remember I told you about the Legendre transform of the entropy. If you apply the Legendre transform of the entropy, you get to this theorem here. And you notice here, you just have this HV of log fi, log of the fi's, and then you sum, multiply by ci. Okay? And that's, it's that theorem. By the way, this is a theorem which I learned from Eric Carlin and Cordero Arauskin. I mean, this whole sort of circle of ideas. Uh, so, so now what we're going to do, we're going to apply that theorem to this mess. And you see, you have to abstract a little bit. So here's a sum. An integral, for all practical purposes, is also a sum. You agree? Right? Yeah? I mean, what you can do is you can approximate such integrals always by discrete sums. I, I wrote d rho. I hope you don't mind. Huh? Makes goes, goes a little bit faster. So you have this stuff. Then you have this remaining thing which we got out of Nelson's theorem, right? And now, you see, this has precisely the structure which we want, right? Namely, why? Because the h of v is here. What is f i of b i of v? Well, this turns out to be this logarithm, right? So what do I do? I make this co correspondence. Sorry, this was wrong. Here should be the logarithm of h. Huh? So this is going to be my, my correspondence with the logarithm here. This integral is 1. Why? Because this thing, I can simply, this is a marginal. I can complement this to an integral over the whole space. The u goes out because it's a rotation. The Hilbert spaces correspond to these subspaces. Where, where, where are they? Uh, yeah, in which these guys project. The bi's correspond to these operators here. That's where they are. And now you have this distinctive pleasure to figure out whether something like this here is true. Notice, this is the b. Let's go back to Brass Complete, right? I have to check this relation. This relation is trivial to check. This relation can be checked. So that's this one. I have to sum over all sigmas. I have to integrate over all rows. OK? That's what I have to do. And what it is is, it turns out that this mass is equals the identity times a number. And what is this number? That's this number. OK? Miracle, right? OK? Now, why is this a miracle? Because now, you see, let me, let me just argue how this you can do that. If you take this, this integral here, right? Then you can, you, you, you see, these guys here, they have nothing to do with the sum on sigma. So you can write it this way. And now, you notice that when you, for example, look at this matrix here. Well, this matrix is, all, is a diagonal matrix which has only zeros and ones. So let's pick a, a, a place. Where, where, the, where there's a 1 here. So that means, say, the, let's pl take the place 1, 1, OK? This matrix element. Well, 
either it's zero or it's a one there. If it's a one there, it means I have to sum over all sigmas which do not contain one. And when you, then you can actually sum that stuff, and what you get is precisely gamma k squared. Now, what is this? By the single duality composition, this is nothing but ak, ak transposed. And now you realize again that this ak, ak transposed, what the, where does it came from? It came from this product of rotations. That stuff you can compute. And it turns out this is precisely this number ckm. OK? So, so what does this mean? This means that in this huge mass here, when you put here the entropy, you can replace this whole sum by e to the minus lambda t sum lambda t to the k over k factorial. And then you have to cmk. That's what your estimate is, times the entropy of your initial condition. Well, every child knows how to do it since kindergarten what this is, and this gives you precisely the theorem which I told you, right? OK? So I know this is a little bit brutal, and you can imagine it took us a while to get there, right? It's not entirely. But what, what, what I, I, I really urge, I mean, I think what I really like to convey is, you see, when you have a complicated system, it doesn't mean that you can compute something pretty explicitly, right? It's really, you get rates, they're explicit, and you know what's going on, right? Now, what you can, of course, complain about is, you can say, wait a moment, this is not really a good theorem. Why? Because what you should be doing is you should take the entropy relative to the equilibrium state. Now that opens up a whole totally new kind of worms. I think it should be able, one should be able to do it, but you have to invent a whole slew of new hypercontractive estimates of operators on the sphere, which are not semigroups. And then you have to also produce a version of brass camp leap on the sphere. Well, we have some experience with that, okay? But this would be a totally new project, and I, at the moment I'm too exhausted, I won't be able to do it, okay? All right? Good. So I, I think you got a little bit of the message how this works. And what I'm going to give you now for the remaining few minutes, I'm going to give you a few. Uh, so here's this result here. Some references, okay? So the fundamental paper about all of this is, of course, the one due to Mark Katz from 1956, where he also mentioned this Katz, what we call Katz conjecture, which then was proved by Elise Jean Ress. Uh, the computation of the gap was done in this paper here. I, I wrote this down because it's just some lecture notes, I mean, very short, and, and it's sort of in a, in a non-fancy way. You know, just the basics. And that's sometimes very nice to read at the beginning, right? Now, this whole thing was, was then elaborated in a paper in ACTA, uh, you know, a long paper where we also compute the gap, or at least prove the Katz conjecture for momentum-preserving collisions. Uh, a nice paper is David Maslin's, who really computes much more about the Katz master equation. And many of the things we, I talked about was, of course, in this beautiful paper of Cedric. And <laughs> the title is interesting. Church and Jan's conjecture is sometimes true and always almost true. Okay. Well, in a way, he's right. In us, in this paper, is where he actually shows this, this lower bound on the entropy production. And Amit was the one then, Amit Einav, who provided the upper bound. Uh, now, you see, what I, in some sense, told you is a kind of a preparation to read some other papers. And here, so these are the really fundamental papers in this business, namely by Stefan and, and Clement Moore. Uh, so this is a nice paper at the beginning. You get a, a first outline of what this whole thing is. And if you then got up, this is the appetizer. And then when you're really hungry, you can go to Inventiones for the next 147 pages and, and, and go through this. It's, it's worth doing it, actually. It's, it's a very nice paper. Okay? It's, this is very fundamental. This is, I would say this is really seminal work. Uh, so now about the thermostats, 
this we started out with Rangini in this paper in Journal of Statistical Physics where we proved this exponential decay of the entropy. The connection between the infinite thermostat and the finite reservoir was actually proved in this paper. Tosunian Hagop is a student, a graduate student of mine. And if you are interested in this Gabetta Toscani Wenbeck metric here, this is the right paper to look at. It's actually a very interesting paper, right? Because we often look things, what is it, L2, LP? No, there are many other interesting metrics, and they really provide a slew of those. Brascombe Leap. Here is the classic paper of Herm, Brascombe, and Elliot Leap. Best constants in Young's inequality. It's converse and it's generalization of more than three functions. That started the whole story. And then Elliot uh, produced a huge paper, Gaussian kernels have only Gaussian maximizers. Now that's actually worth reading again. Why? Because for him, e to the i x y is a Gaussian kernel. So he gets all the sharp constants, you know, in the in the house of Young inequality and all this kind of stuff. Just all comes out of this paper. Okay. This is seminal work. All right. And then. Uh, the, 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 the stuff which I told you, uh, I learned also lots of it from Keith Ball. And that this is beautiful because he uses Brascombe Lieb inequalities to prove theorems about sections of cubes and related problems. It, it has a huge impact on convex geometry, interestingly enough. Okay? And you can also look at this paper. These two are very, very nice papers. He, extra he writes extremely well. That's really worth reading. And then, the, the one who, so this, by the way, I have to say, Keith did it in the rank one case, where these matrices BI are rank one matrices. Now, Frank Barthe, in another terrific paper in Inventions, he actually proved all this kind of stuff for the rank, the arbitrary rank case. And then, uh, we, Eric, Elliot, and I, we discovered this, this, this correlation inequalities on the sphere, and then we realized that heat kernels can do a lot of good to prove all these inequalities. And we did this in this paper also for the rank one case in Brascombe Leap. And that was later done in the general rank case by Bennett, Carberry, Christ, and Terry Tao. Okay? Uh, I also would like to mention Eric Carland and the paper of Eric Carland, Dario Codera Arauskin, namely subadditivity of entropy in relation to Brascombe Leap type inequalities. This is where many of these things, if I told you, show up. And for, for historic reasons, the very first papers were by Loomis and Whitney. This was at Brascombe Leap type inequality, but of course much, much more elementary, right? The one which I showed you was used for the Sobolev inequality. And there is an analogous entropy inequality which was proved by Han. And you see this, is, this goes way back. Hypercontractive estimates. Edward Nelson had his famous paper, The Free Markov Field. That's a, f a, problem, a paper about quantum field theory, where he actually has this inequality. And the guy who actually sort of realized that this inequality, which I told you, this one here, is actually closely related. You can prove it with the sharp logarithmic Sobolev inequality. But, so in other words, Nelson's theorem implies the sharp logarithmic Sobolev inequality and the converse. And of course, about logarithmic Sobolev inequalities, there's lots of stuff. I just put this here for, for historic reasons, of course, these papers of Lenny Gross. Okay? And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. In particular, I would like to thank Francesco for organizing such a terrific conference. And I would also like to thank the supporting staff for this fantastic help in running this place. Thank you.